and welcome to the OnScript podcast, your home for world-class conversations on scripture and theology, where you get to meet some of the best in the field. Visit us at onscript.study. Say hello on Twitter at OnScript Podcast and stop by our Facebook page at facebook.com slash OnScript. Hi, everyone. Welcome back to the OnScript Podcast. I'm Matt Lynch, based here in Vancouver Regent College. I'm a co-host of OnScript along with Matt Bates, Drew Johnson, Aaron Heim, Chris Tilling, and Amy Brown-Hughes, and we are so glad you tuned in. Just a reminder before we get started that OnScript has also started another podcast called Biblical World, and you can subscribe to that wherever you listen to this podcast. We had a few episodes in the past that were cross-listed on this feed, but uh, we're not doing that anymore, so you have to go over to the other Biblical World podcast um, or check it out on onscript.study forward slash biblical world if you want to find out more. And that podcast focuses on the history, archaeology, culture, and geography of the Bible. And we've got some great episodes there. Um, In this episode, you are going to hear from Dr. Dominic Hernandez about his book on Proverbs. Thanks so much for listening. Thanks so much to everyone who gives regularly to OnScript and who gives us ratings on iTunes or wherever you listen. All that stuff is very helpful. I also like the emails I get sometimes from people just sharing the impact of OnScript. Feel free to send word along onscriptpodcast at gmail.com. Uh, you can get in touch with us that way if you want to just reach out and let us know what you think. Okay, thanks so much for listening and enjoy the episode. Welcome back, OnScript listeners. Today, I'm speaking with Dr. Dominic Hernandez, who is the Assistant Professor of Old Testament Interpretation at the Southern Baptist Theological Seminary, where he is also Director of the Spanish Language Program, which has over 700 students in it. He completed his MDiv from Princeton Theological Seminary and PhD in Hebrew Bible at Bar Ilan University in Israel. He's the author of a book that we'll discuss today called Proverbs, Pathways to Wisdom, published by Abingdon Press. Dominic, welcome to OnScript. Thank you very much, Matt. Uh, So you grew up in in New York, in New Jersey, in Puerto Rico. I don't know the percentages of those because uh, you mentioned them in your book. Uh, And I'm just curious about how those contexts shaped the way that you read the Bible. Yeah, good. That's a great question because we all come from different contexts, right? And they're uh, they're formative. They shape us uh, in different ways. You know, I normally tell people something like I spent 75 to 80 percent of my life in either New York, New Jersey or Pennsylvania. So so I was born in New York City. Um, my father is from Puerto Rico and my mother is half Puerto Rican, half Cuban. And then and then we moved to the Philadelphia area when I was young and we lived in a, in a neighborhood called Lacey Park, just outside of Philadelphia. And, and then um, I moved to Puerto Rico for some time and then finished my bachelor's degree in the Philadelphia area, and then moved to New York City again. And after a brief period of time in California, moved to New Jersey. So that's, yeah, that, that, that's, that's the order. Uh, and then, you know, I, we spent, as you, as you made uh, mention, spent some time in Israel, also spent some time in Washington before coming here. Now, as far as sh- those experiences shaping my, my, my reading, you know, I think that there have been different stops along the way that have uh, really been formative in how I've, I've come to the Bible, how I've approached the Bible, especially during my time in the Philadelphia area, uh, where we started going, I started going to a church that taught through the Bible, like taught every single verse of the Bible and thought, wow, this is sort of uh, amazing that people actually do this. Yeah. What church was that? So it, it's, the church is called Calvary Chapel of Philadelphia. It's part of the Calvary Chapel Churches that come out of the Jesus movement. I think the first one started in 1965. And it really was the first church that I had ever gone to that, that taught like every single verse of the Bible. So a lot, of, a lot of Christians will say, no, the entire Bible is inspired by God or from God. And this church actually taught it that way. Yeah, yeah, very cool. I mean, I, I grew up an hour north of Philly, so I was, I was, I was wondering if I, if I knew the oh, church. Yeah? And I, I've been to that what church area? before. Uh, do you know Doylestown? Yeah, of course. Yeah. I, I actually was in the Central Bucks School District for some time. Oh, really? Oh, interesting. Yeah. yeah so, yeah. so Lacey Park Centennial School District. Okay. And just, and just, and I would have gone to Central Bucks West, but my yeah. family 
move. So yeah. there's a connection there. Okay, yeah, yeah. yeah. CB West is uh, known for their football. That's for sure. Yeah, absolutely. At least at least during my time. Yeah, yeah. There was always the East West games, and uh, I definitely went to a few of those. Uh, very exciting. Um, and so, um, yeah, I cut you off, but you you were. Um, at this church that took an expositional approach to the Bible and went verse by verse. And that's, that's shaped how you read scripture or? Absolutely. So I grew up in a household that was God fearing, let's say every Sunday we, you know, at least tried to go to church, right? It was uh, my mother, as uh, I make mention in, in my book, raised four children and then has adopted three. And so uh, we're seven total. And ever since I was a kid, we would, we would go to some, we would strive to go to some type of church function. Um, when I was a, a teenager, that is, we would strive to go to some type of church function weekly. When I was a teenager, however, I, I started going to this church through a connection that I had with a youth group, a youth, a youth pastor in the area. And it was the first church, like I said, that I had ever went to, that I ever went to, that taught through books like Leviticus and Chronicles and uh, for me, that was sort of shocking because the majority of my experience up to that point uh, was 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 um, not that way. Better stated, it was mostly focused in Jesus and the Gospels, which I, I like Jesus. I think we'll probably talk about him a little, but, but uh, and and the Gospels clearly and Paul. But I had never embraced the idea of Christians reading the entirety of the Scriptures until I went to this congregation. Yeah, very cool. Now, um, what were some of the formative influences in terms of nudging you toward biblical scholarship in particular? This is a, a great question because, it, and it's always difficult to pinpoint one thing or another, but I think that there was a, there was a trajectory sort of set out for me that started probably when I was in my, my undergraduate degree. So I was a sort of a severe, fell into sort of severe slacking my first couple of years of college, which is not uncommon, I hear. I mean, I've heard that once or twice. Uh, but I just sort of lost my, my aim, my, my sort of direction um, in life overall. And, and that's when I, I made men mention to, of uh, my, me living in Puerto Rico. I moved to Puerto Rico. And when I was in Puerto Rico, I met my future wife. And, uh, and th things changed for me, for me a bit when I, when I met her. I, I, for, for some reason, I got serious about life. Yeah. Um, but uh, what ended up happening was I came back to the United States and I started a little, little bit, a uh, little ways to go in college. And I, I started to think about what I sort of really wanted to do when I, when I grew up. And I, and I wanted to, to help people by teaching. That's, that's what I initially got into. I was a, I was a kinesiology undergraduate major and my, my goal was to get into teaching physical education and, 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 and coaching. Uh, but I started to feel very much drawn to the idea of, uh, teaching people in a, in a multicultural, multi-ethnic environment. And so I had a, a teacher, a professor in college that said, hey, why don't you just move back to New York City and, and get a job there teaching physical education? And I thought, what a great idea. And that coincided with me applying to Columbia University. I, was, I went to the Teachers College at Columbia University and, and did a master's degree there and taught in a, in a school in the, lower, uh, in the Lower East Side for a couple of years and, and during that time, we went back to another Calvary Chapel church that taught expositionally through the scriptures. And that was the major sort of phase in life. I was in my mid-20s at the time. That started getting me, th I started thinking during that period of time, you know, I actually think that I could probably help people a little bit more with my skill set if I got into teaching the Bible. So that, that was early on what got, me, what got me on this path. And how'd you end up uh, studying at Bar Ilan in Israel. Yeah, so a, a, another great um, sort of question, and there's so many stops along the way, but in short, once we left, uh, so I, we lived in New York City for that period of time. I decided to go to a practical school of ministry in California. So I went to a two-year practical school of ministry that was associated with these Calvary Chapel churches and realized when I was there, wow, I, I I, I really like this. I'm into biblical languages, especially. And uh, I need to go to some place that's accredited in order to be able to, to, to do this uh, for a living. And so um, I, I returned back to the East Coast. I did my Master of Divinity at Princeton Theological Seminary. And while I was at Princeton Theological Seminary, I, was, I started to think about uh, doctoral opportunities in, in Old Testament Hebrew Bible, uh, particularly in places where I could where I could focus a lot on language. And I was getting into textual criticism and Semitic philology at the time. And I spoke with one of the professors there who was not 
so, you know, happy about the idea of me thinking about going abroad. He swore I would never get a job, but he did say, if you go abroad, you have to study with Ed Greenstein. And I said, I said, oh, that's, that's good. That, that's good advice because I had already been corresponding with him. And, and, uh, and so when he said that, and there was a couple of other things that went on during that time, um, that is, I was receiving counsel from different area from different people. W- w- upon him saying that I, I contacted Ed Greenstein immediately, I, we had already been corresponding, like I said, and just said, "Hey, if I go to Israel, will you be my will you be my advisor?" And he, I don't know if he agreed or sort of conceded, but at the end of the day, uh, he he invited me to study with him, and I, and I was um, and I was able to uh, to study at Bar Ilan. He had just transferred, he had just made the move transition from Tel Aviv University to Bar Ilan, and I joined him at Bar Ilan. Uh, and was able to study with him there for the next five years. Oh, fantastic. So, I mean, for those in the world of, familiar with the world of of Hebrew Bible, uh, Old Testament scholarship, his name's familiar, but just give uh, our listeners a sense of who he is and why he's someone you'd want to study with. Well, Professor Ed Greenstein, first and foremost, is just a wonderful person. He is just a great person. And from the very beginning, even when he was counseling me concerning you know, he was giving me guidance concerning next steps in my academic career before I had even agreed to be my advisor. He was just much more concerned about me as a person than he was about me as a as a, a future scholar or, or, or anything else. Uh, that's the first thing. And, and that was what really um, encouraged me to, to ask him to be my advisor. The, the other thing um, about Professor Greenstein is that you know, he is a, he is ex- well-rounded as an understatement. He, he is, his, his, the depth of his knowledge in so many areas, whether it be um, Semitic philology or ancient Near Eastern studies, um, you know, his knowledge of Akkadian, you know, and, and other Semitic languages, um, his literary theory, you know, he does, he, he, he his hermeneutics, uh, all of these different areas, um, you know, metaphor, I mean, I could keep going on and on, that's the type of well-rounded experience that I that I really wanted. So not only was he just a great person, and he is a great person, but he's so well-rounded that he's the he's the type of person that you, you just converse with him, and <laughs> you you just learn it, by osmosis. You pick up knowledge, yeah. And and that's the kind of supervisor that can can run with you no matter what topic you pick as well to to focus on your PhD dissertation. He always was much more concerned. He always treated me as a junior colleague from the very beginning. And I think when people get into PhD programs, you know, generally speaking, many people, people that do PhD programs don't like to admit that they're very needy, I guess. But at the beginning of a PhD, you tend to be quite needy, especially if you move across the world or across the country to do it. And he always treated me like a junior colleague, which was very encouraging. It was exactly what I needed during that time to build up the confidence to be able to one day uh, go out on my own and and do some of this on my own, of course, with his guidance still. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, look into your book now, um, Proverbs Pathways to Wisdom. Uh, You compare the book of Proverbs to getting like a bewildering puzzle. Like you can imagine one of those thousand piece puzzles that you get it and it's just a, a whole bunch of pieces. And and Proverbs are almost by definition, especially the sayings, little pieces that you can you can in theory take and quote and use and benefit from. Um, but you suggest that there's a little more method to the madness than just a whole bunch of pieces that they're, the puzzle can be put together in some semblance um, so what are some of the signs of literary art and craft to this book that might on the surface look like a bunch of jumbled sayings? Right. So there's no doubt that those jumbled sayings at some point in some, at some time had their sort of setting in life, right? There's it's in They all had this sort of setting in life, but it's very difficult. We're so far removed from the text and so far from that setting in life. It's very difficult to sort of get back to that, that the, sort of the origin of all of these, and and all of these were eventually compiled b- by one or a group of, of people that put it into a, a document for us that we now call Mishle or the Book of Proverbs. And there's an introduction, and then there's a sort of a grand finale at the end. So when we look at this text, we don't at this at this book. We don't doubt that these there there are indeed individual adages, but we we say what were the 
the author, we could say author, right? The final compiler. What was that person maybe trying to do throughout the book? And one of the major things that I think that we need to pay attention to is repetition. So many times, this, in many ways, the same topics are repeated. And, and it seems that by way of repetition, the author is trying to uh, let readers know that these particular topics are very important. Hmm. And, and what are some of the, the topics that, that you saw emerging as you looked at repeated patterns throughout the book of Proverbs? Right. So n- number one, we could say is the fear of the Lord and the repetition of the fear of the Lord, this idea of revering God to the point where where human beings want to obey the one true God of Israel. So the fear of the capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D, right? The fear of the Lord is is a big one. And then we have these, these other themes that relate to how people that are fears of the Lord interact or, or, or live in their respective societies. So for example, how poor people are treated, how those that are disadvantaged in society or vulnerable are treated is, a, is another theme. We also have this, I, this, this reverence or respect for the family unit. So many times there are these family relationships that are mentioned repeatedly. Father, son, also mother is repeated. Um, obviously, the marriage relationship is, is uh, spoken about in the book of Proverbs. So those are just a couple of things that are repeated. Uh, how one uses their money, for example, is another one, or hard work. The, the, there's this contrast between being lazy and working hard. And those are just a, a couple. I think I mentioned, maybe mentioned five uh, there that are, that are I, I think I, to use the illustration, corner puzzle pieces. They, they stick out. Now, um, you also, in addition to saying that these themes recur throughout the book, you also highlight the idea that literary context is really important. And, and I appreciate your look at Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. So, where it, it's a, there are two verses that most of us are familiar with if we've been around the church a bit. Um, and if you, what was that group? Sixpence. They had the song went back in the nineties. Um, trust in the Lord. Um, Sixpence, uh, none yeah, the richer. Exactly. Um, yeah. So trust in the Lord with all your heart and do not lean in your own understanding in all your ways, acknowledge him and he will make your path straight. So, um, but I, I appreciate your look at context. So what, just maybe taking that example, what are some ways that the broader context of those verses help illuminate what the writer is trying to communicate? Right. So trust in the Lord with all your heart and do not lean on your own understanding. A, a verse, an adage that many Christian people, are, many people are familiar with. And um, we, we sort of, we can, re- we can recite this, but we, Heck, we, we have to recognize it. it. We can crochet it, yes. Uh, we recognize that this comes within the context of, of an actual book. And so the first thing that we have to do is deal with the language that is actually here in these verses, trust in the Lord, uh, trust in the Lord with all of your heart. So uh, I, I think I, you know, write in my book, how is it possible to trust with your heart? So here Im- immediately sort of a, a, a ringer goes off in our, our mind, sort of an alarm. Do you trust with your heart? It, okay. May, maybe, maybe we trust in our heart. Let's keep reading with our heart. Okay. Probably a metaphor here, but let's keep reading. Do not lean on your own understanding. Ah, maybe the heart is related to the understanding, right? As we continue to read and we see there being um, some parallelism, w- what does it mean to not, to, tr- to, to not trust in your heart or lean on your own understanding? Well, as we continue to read here in verse seven, we read the author is stating explicitly, do not be wise in your own eyes, fear the Lord and turn away from evil. So as we think about trust in the Lord with all of your heart, lean on your own understanding, as we continue to read, um, we, we come across the, I mean, just uh, actually the, the next section that we, that we rarely quote is really one of, is crucial to understanding uh, uh, chapter three, verses five and six, which is by, if we, are, if we trust in the Lord with all of our heart, we're not wise in our own eyes, which is what we, we go on to read here, uh, and we f- we fear the Lord. That is one of the one of the one of the things that we're able to see. One of the one of the things that we're able to see that people who fear the Lord exhibit is that they don't act wise in their own eyes. They do not trust essentially in their own understanding, and they turn away from evil. So, 
really just citing that one verse is about, let's say, 40 or 50 percent of what that particular passage might be trying to say. Yeah, it, it reminds me, uh, like attending to the literary context of the individual, I know that's not in the sayings portion of Proverbs, but um, I, I, uh, I took a, a class with Bruce Waltke here at Regent when I was a student, and and he's obviously um, as well done a lot of work in Proverbs. And uh, I remember him saying that, so he had contracted, he had a contract to do the, the um, New International Commentary in the Old Testament for Proverbs. He got like, I think he said about 10 years into working on it and then started reading around literary theory about like, this is sort of Robert Alter stuff coming out um, about like, well, maybe the Old Testament authors were actually really good, could create really good literary art. And he went back to the drawing board, he said, and, and essentially sort of restarted his whole study of Proverbs with attention to the literary artistry of the book. Um, which really blew my mind that he was willing to not scrap 10 years of work, but really go back to the drawing board after 10 years and relook at the whole book and then sort of produced his commentary out of that. Um, so I, I'm jumping ahead here to the end, but I, I thought it was really important that you see the literary artistry of the book kind of coming to its culmination at the end of the book with the Proverbs 31, you call her a warrior woman, um, which is a, a a great translation of Eshet Chayil. So, thank you, thank you, man. I appreciate it. Um, so, could you give our listeners just a sense of like how the threads of the book pull together there in that last uh, scene? I thought that was really helpful. This is a great question. I have something to say about your the illustration that you just mentioned with Dr. Waltke, because I think it's I think it demonstrates a humility that we have that we should have as we approach the book of Proverbs and biblical literature in general, but especially Proverbs. Now, sometimes in seminary or in church experiences where we get into really studying the book of Proverbs, we think, you know, wh where was the life setting of this and, and exactly how should we work this out? And when we do that, to, and we should, we, sh we need to study every single proverb and every single word. I, I don't have anything against that. But if we simply focus on that, then we, maybe we lose sight of, of the big picture here. And the big picture here is that all of these Proverbs were eventually put together in the current form that we have them. And they were done so, you ready for the presupposition here? I presuppose that they were done, th that, that this was compiled by really smart people. <laughs> yeah. The people that put the Proverbs together in the book or the person that put the Proverbs together in the book that we have now, because we, you know, it's very clear internally, we have different sections. I mean, even chapter 25 says, this is a different section. And chapter 30 says, this is a big section, right? So we have different sections. The way it was put together was done by someone that was smart. And, and the person wa was, was striving to, to bring, the, bring readers along from beginning to end. And we see that order. If we, if we look for order, we, we see it. If we presuppose that there could be order, we see it. And so to, 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 to touch on a little bit what you said about Dr. Waltke, uh, I, I think it's very important to to consider the fact that these writers were were writing to be read and and that we should read as if we try to do our best to be interlocutors with the text as close as we possibly can be to the text as opposed to dissecting it as if it's some sort of just just some sort of foreign object we want to do our best to receive what the as much as we can what the author might be doing with the audience now, having said that, I, th I think we do see some of that order um, in, in the Proverbs. So, for example, it's, it's very clear at the beginning we have sort of an introduction, right? This is why the book is being written. And then we have, um, after the introduction, middle of chapter 1 through the end of chapter 9, we, we have, a, we have a, a distinct section in which we, have, we see the cycle of the, 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 good pa the pathway to wisdom and the pathway to darkness or destruction. And then between chapters 10 and 30, we have these... What they what feel like random adages, but but by way of repetition, we're able to see major themes come out, and and then we get to thirty thirty one, and we have a sort of a, a lemuel saying, and then we have this eshet chayil, this 20, these twenty two verses, that's an acrostic poem, and interestingly enough, in the eshet chayil section in that poem, we see a lot of the same themes, the same motifs that were especially. Uh, highlighted in chapters 10 through 30 
coming out in this personification of one of uh, of wisdom through this woman Eshet Chayil. So we see her, her relationship to her family, for example, being highlighted there, which is also highlighted in previous sections. We see her usage of speech. Um, we see some diligence in work being highlighted. We see her earnest, uh, earning honest wages, which is, is close to diligence and work. Uh, and we see her caring for people. Th- those are particularly vulnerable people, like in, in, the, in that context, children. Uh, that is in the Proverbs 31 context, children. But what we, a- what we end up seeing is in the Proverbs 31 women, in this warrior woman, it's not just a sort of a, a, a nice woman. No, this is a warrior woman. Like, please read this, right? We see the we see the manifestation of these motifs that are repeated throughout the book of Proverbs. I think if we're sensitive as we read, we're able to pick that up by the time we get to the really the apex at the end. Now you said uh, two really important things about Proverbs thirty one, and in particular uh, that acrostic poem about war- warrior woman. Um, one was very personal about your own mother and. You're, um, you tell the, the very moving story of when you were five and learned that your dad had passed away and then your mom single-handedly raising your family. And, and you see a lot of these qualities in, in her. Um, so I'd love to hear you just kind of reflect on her, but then also how this is a, is a poem for everybody. Sure. Yeah. So the story that you're making reference to is when I was five years old. You know, I don't remember much about when I was five years old, a uh, long time ago, decades ago, right? But uh, I do remember when I came home from summer camp, I remember my mother taking my older brother and I, who also went to summer camp, into a room and, and telling us uh, that daddy went to heaven, that he had passed away. And I remember that experience vividly. You know, even sitting here right now talking to you, I remember that experience vividly. And then I I go on just to talk about some of the things that my mother went through raising us. You know, I mean, my mother didn't have a high school education. She didn't have a driver's license. She had four children, you know, between the ages of six months and and nine. I believe my older brother was nine. And uh, we were living in a low-income housing sector outside of of Philadelphia. Um, And and she raised us all, you know, and uh, and the sacrifices that she went through getting her GED and then going going to college. I remember when she got her driver's license. I, you know, taking all of these jobs, a day job and then a night job, all of these things that she did, women that do that type of thing should be called Eshet Chayil. And we have, we should not have any problem assigning or, or not, not assigning, but, but using that term as a respectful term to, to honor what, what women like my mother do and have done. The problem ends up being when the Eshet Chayil of Proverbs 31 turns into a checklist of things that women should be. And that's what I argue essentially against, but, but not in a polemic way, I, I think. Uh, what, what, I'm, what I think that is, is really um, being, what, what is really happening here is, first of all, let's honor, let's honor women like my mother and all the other women, and just that, you know, women for, for, uh, for who they are and what they do on the one hand. On the other hand, let's look at what the author is, is doing here in Proverbs. Is the author really saying that all women must be exactly like this Proverbs 31 woman? And I think that if we read, paying careful attention to, and, and sensitive to what the authors might be doing throughout the book of Proverbs, then when we get to the end, we see something far greater than a checklist. But we see this, like I, I said previously, this personification of what it looks like to be a person filled with wisdom, a person that fears the Lord, that is constantly saying yes to God in every step down their own personal pathway. And, and do you think it's personified as a woman because earlier in the book you've had woman wisdom, woman folly, and so at the end it kind of culminates with this is like the embodiment of what you're to pursue, but everyone is to pursue wisdom. A- a- absolutely. So we see... Uh, uh, again, those sections, particularly between chapters one and nine, that uh, where w- women are portrayed, I think are sometimes mistaught within the context of, of churches. And so, sort of like this this woman who is a harlot, she's she's depicted as a as like a like a real woman, and this woman whose wisdom is depicted you know, sort of as a as a real woman, and, and that's actually not what the author is doing, in my opinion, at all. What the author is doing is using you know, figurative language and hyperbolic language at the same time to say 
go this way because if not you're gonna die like this is what don't go that path this is really bad okay so so go this way go down this path you see you see what was you know this is if you fear the Lord, you're going to constantly say yes to the Lord. You're going to take every step. You're going to gain wisdom. You're going to grow in wisdom. But don't go the way that that don't go there. Right? There's really bad consequences, and we have this cycle happen several times in chapters one one to nine. So, so I don't think that we are talking about like you know literal women here, right? And I don't think they should be taught as literal women. Uh, and now I want to say one more thing, if I can. In case there are some listeners that are kind of like, uh, I don't know about that. Chapter 31 verses 10 through 31 is an acrostic, which means every verse starts with the, with the next letter of the Hebrew alphabet. Aleph, bet, gimel, dalet, hey, vav, zayn. Okay, so here's the thing. The author is intentionally being artistic here. We lose that in English. Okay, but the author is intentionally being artistic. So we have to ask, what is the purpose of this art? How, we have to observe the poem as a as a as a piece of art, right? We don't observe this as a as a checklist. We observe it as a piece of art, and when we observe it as a piece of art, we see this warrior woman that is constantly, uh, you know, saying yes to the the commands and the word of God, as is depicted throughout the proverbs. I'd like to uh, transition to a speed round. Uh, we do these sure. in the middle, just uh, kind of quick fire question. You're hungry, and in Jerusalem, what do you go for? Oh, hummus lina. Hummus lina. So there's a hummus place. Yes, there's a hummus place. You got to Google this. Lina. It's, or maybe Lina's hummus, if you just Google this, and, and you'll see. Uh, it's in the Christian quarter in Jerusalem. There's someone there, uh, you know, making hummus on the spot. I highly recommend eating in the, there's like a second floor. It's sort of an attic. You could sit there with friends for an hour or two and just eat hummus and all other uh, great Middle Eastern stuff. So definitely recommend that. Sounds fantastic. What What's the most significant book in biblical studies in the last 50 years? This is supposed to be a speed round. <laughs> Your book. Oh, absolutely. Uh, yeah. Uh, um, you know, okay. A, a book that was deeply impactful on me that I think is very important uh, is reading uh uh, the Poetics of Biblical Narrative by Meir Sternberg. Mm, yeah, that's a good one. No one's mentioned that yet, um, which I'm surprised about. Um, but that's a, that's a good pick. Uh, there's uh, there's some d- debate with currently uh, Will Kynes is arguing that we should get rid of the genre label, wisdom literature. Um, are you a, a stalwart defender of, of the wisdom genre label, or is that not important? I'm... Um- I'm, it is important. I'm not a stalwart defender of anything that I'm not completely sure about or didn't invent myself. So uh, I didn't invent the wisdom genre. I, I actually am um, going to be presenting on this at a special thing that Beeson is doing in the fall. And so I, I have some ideas about this. I would like to say that I think I, I'm not willing to give up on the wisdom genre quite yet. The will is brilliant and everybody should read his arguments. Okay. Um, now I... I want you to give a movie review, and it doesn't matter if you've seen it or not. Uh, so I, I just, I thought, what's a theme related to your book? And I used the word wisdom, put it into uh, Amazon and looked under movies, and there's a movie called Wisdom, 1987. Uh, I'll read you the, the description of, of the movie. A man whose criminal past is keeping him from getting ahead embarks on a series of Robin Hood-style bank robberies with his girlfriend. A tale of modern folk heroes, written and directed by Emilio Estevez. How many stars do you give it out of five? Well, first of all, have you seen it? I have not seen it. Okay, so how many stars would you give it? I would give it zero because he's clearly not on the pathway to wisdom if he's robbing banks. <laughs> okay. That's, that's, it. that's like the exact yeah. opposite of what the Proverbs teaches. Yeah, fair enough. Uh, there's, a, so zero. there's another movie, believe it or not. It's called Nagging Thoughts. The subtitle is Proverbs 30, 21 to 23. And for some reason, this, this amazed me. It's actually, it's rated PG-13. I'm, I'm curious why a Proverbs... Uh, anyway, uh, nagging thoughts. Okay, here's here's the description of the movie. Nagging thoughts from a Proverbs twenty seven sixteen woman. That's that's the woman who um, is uh, I guess like um, a, a dripping um, roof uh, on how four unbearable things to the earth, which includes a wife, reflects the justice and compassion of God. I'm not sure I understand that description. How many stars out of five do you give it? 
Well, it's already at least in the three range because I don't even understand <laughs> what, what, what it's, the subtitle's too long. So, so you know, I'm going to have to stick with the three range. It's sort of like, um, you know, because I don't want to be too harsh, but uh, I don't even know what this is about. And I just wrote a book on Proverbs. You know, you know, uh, <laughs> it's it's like you'd want to advise someone not to put like a reference in a, a movie subtitle if you want it to do well in the box office. Maybe that could just be a little advice from biblical scholars. All right. Do you have a favorite novel or poet or film? It changes, to be completely honest with you. I, I do. It goes back and forth. It depends on the ones that I'm reading. Uh, I have to choose one and I have to do this quickly. Favorite novel. You know, I really like The Chosen by Chaim Potok. I also really like The Hobbit, which I haven't, I didn't read until I was an adult. I know I gave you two already. Um, I, I will say, uh, let me tell you this. There's one book. It's not really a novel, but it's called A Day No Pigs Would Die. It was one of the first books that I ever read from beginning to end. And, and spoiler alert, it's a, a, a kid loses his father uh, relatively early in life who was, a, who was a pig hunter or he w- would kill pigs. And anyway, long story short, it, it touched me because I lost my father early, early in life as well. So that also sticks with me uh, many, many years later. Yeah, those are all really good picks. Um, there's a, a music group called the Mountain Goats. I don't know if you've heard of them, but they have a song called Proverbs 627. Um, it's about can a man scoop fire into his lap without his clothes being burned? Just thought uh, you'd want to know that for, as a point of interest. Oh, thank, thank you. I appreciate it. Do you also, I mean, having spent time in Israel, do you also have a passion for the sort of geography and archaeology of the Bible? Is that an interest of yours? What's really interesting is that, uh, you know, geography and archaeology of the Bible, p- people don't understand outside of the field, particularly my students, that those are completely different areas from what I do, right? And so, like, uh, you know, I remember when I w- went to, when I first got my PhD or I was a PhD student, people would hear that I'm a PhD student in Bible, and they would ask me, are there going to be cats in heaven? And I'd be like, that's not exactly what I'm doing. <laughs> uh, you know, so, 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 when people mention geography and when people mention archaeology, I am certainly interested. I I do have to make very clear, however, that's not my primary area of interest. So, so do you have a favorite site to visit in Israel if you're taking uh, people yes, around but, or just going to visit yourself? Yes, but you know, when I go to Israel or when I'm with friends in Israel, I normally like to go to places where you can chill and they're nice. You're nice to take pictures and stuff. So I really like to go to Caesarea by the sea, Caesarea Maritima, Maritima. And, and uh, I do like to go to Megiddo, obviously lots of history and archaeology at, at Megiddo, but I really like the view, the view overlooking the Jezreel Valley. Uh, and it's an area in Israel that's just so beautiful, it not, not so inhabited, not so crowded, I feel very peaceful overlooking the Jezreel Valley. So those are probably my two favorite places. So you wrote your doctoral dissertation on Job, and what, in a sort of nutshell, was your research on in Job. Yes. Is it possible to talk about a dissertation in a nutshell? Have you mastered this? Yet? I have not, but I'm expecting right. you to maybe. <laughs> yes. All right. Here, 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 here goes nothing. So many people study Job from a perspective of theodicy, right? They look at Job and they're like, the, you know, the, Job is an innocent person and he's suffering. And so why does God let this type of thing happen to a, a person who is Tam Yashar, he's an upright and you know an innocent person. So so many people view it and try to explain it from that perspective. I actually tried to do my best to enter sort of into the world of Job and deal with some of the issues that he was dealing with. And one of the things that he deals with is this issue of not that he's not just that he's suffering, but that he observes the wicked prospering. And and and, and interestingly enough, in in other ancient Near Eastern what we would call pi, quote unquote pious sufferer. Uh, poems or compositions, we see that there was also a concern by some of these quote unquote pious sufferers, if there is such a thing, uh, it, of, of of sort of observing that people that weren't as religious as them were also prospering. And so uh, my my work was essentially a comparative work between Job's the first two cycles of speeches in Job in, in the book of Job and some of these other compositions, trying to see if we could glean, especially from the difficult, or uh, something about the difficult words, phrases, and imagery that we see in Job that he uses to express this issue that he's dealing with, which is the prosperity of the wicked. I think he, call, I think he comes to a con- 
to ultimate sort of conclusions in chapter 21 concerning uh, the prosperity of the wicked. Oh, so that was that sure yeah, enough? that was. So why, why you right, know, good. if the flip side of the typical theodicy question. So how does, how is that for you moving from research in a book like Job, where you're dealing with the complexities and messiness and suffering and prosperity of life to a book like Proverbs, where at least on the surface, you're often dealing with a black and white picture. Mm -hmm. Well, that's, that's a, that's a great question. So let me answer this at two different levels. First of all, the personal level, and then maybe the, you know, the, the professional level. Okay. So personally, not that there's much of a dichotomy here, but I think you'll hear it. So personally, uh, it doesn't like, for me, it doesn't matter what, what book of the Bible I'm studying or writing on or teaching. I got into this because I love the Bible and I've, you know, thank God I've been able to, um, develop some expertise, a little bit of expertise. And so I use this to, 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 you know, one, a form of expression of that is through my writing and, and hopefully edifying other people and helping them better understand, especially difficult sections of the Bible. It doesn't really matter where it is for me. So now, for example, I'm writing a commentary on Nahum, Habakkuk, and Zephaniah. So that's, that's significantly different in some ways, actually. Uh, not, you know, obviously a lot of poetry there as well. So that's the, the personal level. Now, now the per, at, at, a, at a professional level, I, I will say that um, as, I, as I study bu- the book of Job, you know, the first two cycles of speech, basically every single word, um, I, I started to realize how much Job's friends sound like the book of Proverbs in many ways. Um, essentially, n- not properly contextualizing the Proverbs in, in many ways. This is sort of a pop version of what I've what I've learned. We can talk about some of the nitty gritty if you'd like, but what, what what we end up seeing is that these books are not as they're not as different as what as as maybe your question made it sound. It's not like Proverbs is is white and 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 black. There actually is some gray there because they need to be properly contextualized. We see this through through reading through the whole book, and Job's friends actually. And understood some of these very similar proverbial sayings to be white and black when actually they didn't apply to Job's case. Yeah, I, th- I think you're right that um, Job or Proverbs complexity comes out through the interplay of different proverbs as you set them alongside each other, not in the individual proverb, which is often on its own black and white, like the way of the righteous and the way of the wicked. But uh, one of my favorite examples is I'm not going to get the quote right, but. The, the idea in one proverb where wealth is like a high wall of protection um, that, that preserves you in the day of trouble. And, and there's a truth to that, that having money can save you from disaster. And then it, Proverbs comes back to that later and says that the wealth of a person is like a high wall in their imagination. And, and so it can also provide false protection. So, so you get this complex view of the world, but it only comes out as you consider various Proverbs on a given theme, because the format of the Proverbs saying is almost by necessity, black and white, because that's part of its memorable quality, right? Right. I think probably the the most maybe memorable or frequently uh, quoted example is is Proverbs chapter 26, verses 4 and 5, which says, answer not a fool according to his folly. And then the very next verse says, answer a fool according to his folly. You know, and, and sometimes these verses are treated as if the eventual compiler of the Proverbs didn't recognize that these were complete contradictions. You know, that this is a this is a complete, just on face value, a complete contradiction, unless, of course, the Proverbs need to fit a context. And, and if the Proverbs fit a context, then both of these fit different contexts and are completely, we could say, true adages or helpful adages when they're understood within the proper context. Now, that's precisely what Job's friends didn't get. And so they spoke a lot like biblical wisdom, like Proverbs, but they, uh, but they, their, their sayings were not, and maybe we could say beliefs or whatever, were not properly contextualized. Yeah, they, yes. they didn't know when to deploy one of those Proverbs or the other. Um, Yeah, that, that's really helpful. And I I like those examples of Proverbs 26, four and five, because it, it emphasizes the contextual nature. Um, It also reminds me of the proverb, uh, the beginning of wisdom is get wisdom. 
and and almost it, it and I was just I'd love to hear you reflect on that because it, it almost feels like Proverbs requires wisdom in the first place. And so what kind of journey does the book imagine you going on to actually acquire wisdom? Like what's the process by which uh you know, if someone is saying I would like to become wise, I feel naive, I I think I don't always make great decisions. I don't always know what to do in life circumstances. How do you go about acquiring wisdom? What's the process that Proverbs envisions? Yeah, your 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 example I think is excellent because the Proverbs does do this type of thing. There are many sayings like this. Um, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Wait a second. Hold on a second. So is the fear of the Lord wise? Yeah. And how, right. So the fear of the Lord is clearly presented as, as wise, right? That's the right thing. So it's wise. So is, it's the beginning of wisdom. And what we end up, I think what we end up seeing throughout the Proverbs, Proverbs especially Proverbs chapters one through nine, is that there is this, there's a disposition that's encouraged early on in the book of Proverbs to be humble and to constantly say yes to the word of the Lord, right? Humility. And we're called at the very, well, readers are called at the very beginning to, to, to attain wisdom, but they, and to hear, but, but they're called to hear by way of reading. So the idea is as we read this, that's, that's a wise decision. We learn to fear the Lord, which is the, the beginning down this path. We attain more wisdom. We fear the Lord more. We continue to walk down this path. So it, it seems that what, what Proverbs is actually doing, and this fits well, I think, with the pathway imagery, is that it's setting out a trajectory. And as you continue on that trajectory, you fear the Lord more. You're wiser. You fear the Lord more. You gain more knowledge of the Holy One. You gain more insight into life. You're able to better uh, practically apply the the individual adages, and you fear the Lord more. And you're and we you know ad nauseum. Uh, I think that's that's what the pro- I think a practical reading of especially the first nine chapters of the Book of Proverbs points out. What's a a model for teaching or? using Proverbs in the church? Like, how, how do you, how would you like to see the church engage with a book like Proverbs more? I get asked this question frequently because when I talk about the Proverbs and I, I, I teach a class at the seminary on Proverbs, I, I you know, I, I try to do my best to be a motivational speaker when it comes to reading, especially the difficult sections of the Bible. And and some of these Proverbs can be difficult. And so I pump the, the students up and to, to teach the Proverbs. And then they say, yeah, but professor, how do we do this in like our church? I'm a, I'm a pastor. I'm training to be a pastor. How do we teach through the Proverbs? There's 31 chapters. They're individual adages. You already admitted. We don't know exactly where they all come from. So how do we do this? And, and I think there are a couple ways to go about this. First of all, you already know my background, right? I have this sort of expositional at all costs training. So, so I think there is a place to go through the book of Proverbs expositionally, beginning to end, but it's probably not on the Sunday morning, sir, during the Sunday morning service that most Christian people, uh, you know, have on Sunday mornings. Uh, uh, I speak in, in churches and in many Sunday morning services, I get handed a uh, sort of a bulletin or a, an outline of the service and it says, you will teach for 27 and a half minutes. And I'm kind of like, ah, Okay. That's not the context in which we we can really go through the book of Proverbs expositionally. There needs to be thought, uh, reflection on the Proverbs, discussion on the Proverbs. So maybe that type of study can be done on a a Wednesday evening or a Sunday evening, or, you know, or a small group Bible study. That type of setting might be the best setting to go through all of the individual prover- proverbs. Now, I I think that if um, that you know, teachers of the Bible m- that want to cover the majority of the book sh- could talk could talk about the book thematically, and so, and many of those themes that will be broached on, let's say, a Sunday morning service or a teaching, a big group teaching, will be those that are repeated throughout the book of Proverbs that we've already spoken about. Um, I think it's possible in a half hour or forty minute teaching session to to give some of the literary context, the context of the book, uh, and, and talk some about the, the Proverbs, the, p- these particular themes in their, in their biblical setting in that quantity of time. It's just, it's just quite difficult. What are some common missteps when people go to interpret the book of Proverbs? 
Yeah, I think we've already broached this topic. I think probably the most famous and literally famous, what I would consider to be a mis, mis, sort of misguided way of interpreting the text is Proverbs 31, uh, 31 verses 1 through 31. But I, I think that the, what, what ends up happening in, with many interpreters there is applicable to the Proverbs in general. So we, we see a, a short adage, we, we memorize the short adage, and we really sort of interpret it independently outside of what the author might be doing with that adage or how that adage might be, or the, you know, the proverb might be reflecting a, a broader theme. So I, I guess if I could jump on another example that we just used, the, the answer of fool according to his folly, right? Imagine if we just memorized one of those, right? We didn't have the balance there. We would be doing the right thing half of the time. And many, many times that's how Proverbs are, 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 are treated, you know, uh, they are memorized and try, and we try to s- sort of stuff them into diff- situations, apply them in situations in which they don't apply. And I, I do think that that is a, that is a mistake that, that can actually have some pretty um, harmful consequences, especially when we talk about Proverbs 31 versus to, you know, 10 to 31. Yeah, and you use the example in the book of, of uh, train up a child in the way they should go and when they're old, they, they won't depart from it. Um, as I mean, that can be really harmful for parents who think, hey, it, you know, this, this must be a reflection on me if, if my kid goes off the rails for a while. And, you know, obviously that's, or we judge other people on that basis. It, when we try to universalize individual proverbs, yeah, that can have real consequences. You know, Matt, that's actually, so that's probably number two on my list of things that I think are are maybe misguided ways of reading the Proverbs. The the second one is that, are those verses that relate to parenting as if those, those, those sayings are promises, right? Reading the Proverbs as promises is, is a, it can be quite a mistake um, because there are promises in the Bible. We, we do read those promises, but the Proverbs aren't written in that, in that sense, which we've, we've been able to talk about already in, in, in other f- certain situations. The major thing about the parenting, however, and I, I try to point this out in my book, is that those parenting f- Proverbs are never directed at the children. And so many times... Uh, parents that use these proverbs in in discipline will will say to the child, you know, spare the rod, spoil the child, or something like this. When in actuality, that proverb is directed at the parent, right? That it's saying, you know, pro- parents need to have the discipline in order to be able to discipline their children, or need to be able to maintain order in a way that reflects their fear of the Lord, right? It's not saying use these verses to let your children why know why they're about to get it. That's not, that's, that's like not, a, but, but that does happen. Right. So again, we're all in this, you know, everybody that loves the book of Proverbs is in this together. We're trying to interpret this and apply this, but we have to make sure we're not making grave mistakes while we're doing this and tr- understanding the Proverbs 31 woman to exclusively be a che- checklist of things women should, should do or tr- strive to do. That's a grave mistake using the parenting Using the parenting verses to to point out to your, your children why you are disciplining them, I think is a grave mistake. It's not. I don't think that they're intended to be used that way. Yeah, and and uh, you've got a couple of resources around this book as well. Do you want to just uh, let our listeners know what those are? Sure. There is a a a, um, a DVD that I made that has four sessions of about let's say between ten and fourteen minutes or so. It's intended for to, to be conversation starters um, in a small group Bible study. And then also there's a study guide that was written that also facilitates the small group Bible study. So the idea is that if you purchase the book and would like to study it, the book of Proverbs with others, uh, but don't have a lot of experience leading a Bible study on your own, you could purchase all of the resources and, and facilitate a study that I actually have written and, and lead through video. Fantastic. And you're writing this commentary on Nahum, uh, Zephaniah Haggai. W- what series is that in? So now I'm writing a book um, that's going to be called something like Exploring the Old Testament with Baker Academic. And then after that, um, I'm going to be writing a, a commentary on Nahum, Habakkuk, and Zephaniah with Cascade in a, in a series, a new series called The Bible in God's World. And then I have a, I have a contract to write the Song of Solomon's commentary 
uh, with Erdman's and the New International Commentary of the Old Testament. So those are the oh, fantastic. Those are my subsequent book, book projects, yes. So you're, you're spanning the, the breadth of the Old Testament, which sounds like you're in your happy place then. I am very much in my happy place, dealing with mostly quite, quite difficult texts. Yeah, that's for sure. Well, uh, Dominic, thank you so much for taking the time to speak with OnScript today and for all your insights and your wisdom and for sharing that with us. Matt, thank you very much for this invitation. It was a pleasure to talk with you. You have been listening to OnScript, delectable conversations on scripture and theology. If this episode has brought you inner peace or lit your biblical fire, please consider a small donation of just 2 or $5 per month. Information on how to donate can be found at onscript.study slash donate.